good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hopefully, you've been having a fantastic time with uh, the sessions. They have already proceeded, and they have been pretty good. At least the ones I have been able to attend have been very good. We are fortunate today. We have uh, Adriana from uh, MNP, uh, it's a chart accounting firm. We have uh, uh, Shahid from uh, Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment. The other couple of people who are supposed to be here and hopefully will join, uh, one is Arif Hamid from uh, Equifax, and Jamie Reese, who uh, is a CISO with actually a few organizations, and I've known him for a long time too. But unfortunately, he had an incident that will uh, may allow him to come because his power has been taken out by some truck. So we'll get cracking because we only have 45 minutes. And I'll just set the stage and then have this uh, wonderful uh, panel start to answer your questions and take it uh, there. So we know that the cybersecurity, uh, somebody's joined in, this is probably Arif, I think. Yeah, hi, it's Arif. Okay, fantastic, Arif, we just kicked it off. So what what is happening is that there's been a lot of uh, increase, a tremendous increase in uh, cybersecurity attacks. Um, and with people working from home, we're now having a different challenge, although you might argue, why would that be different? People are working from home uh, and out of the office, uh, perhaps not to this scale, but that's another challenge. So what we're gonna look at is some key issues, and then hopefully you guys can ask some questions and uh, our panel can take it here. So one of the, uh, when you look at last or last couple of days, one of the interesting things, then we'll start with, because Dr. N. Kavokian already parked this issue about privacy. Security and privacy, the way I've always seen it, are tied. That they're one side, the other side of the coin. You can't have security without privacy and can't have privacy without security. So we're gonna start there and then drill down to all the big issues we'll leave to the little back there. Um, what do you believe is the best way to deal with this issue? Because obviously, Education is involved in there for sure. So why don't we start with you, Shahid? Sorry, uh, Bashir, you got cut off. Is the question around how to deal, how do privacy and security sort of go hand in hand? Yeah, they go hand in hand, right? Because they are the each different side of the same coin. Question is, how would you? Because it revolves around education. It's also a structural issue that organizations are not structured in that manner. So that doesn't help, but we, given all the challenge, how do you go about uh, from your task to try and make sure that people understand that? Yeah, so, so you know, uh, I've, I've been blessed that I've worked in a lot of uh, tech companies over the last 10 years and now at Maple Leafs at Sports and Entertainment. And uh, one, of the, one of the ways we have always focused on when it comes to any sort of privacy or security related matters, we've, the idea is to use the software development idea is to shift left. And the idea starts with not waiting for privacy and security to be done at a later stage in the process, but do it as early as possible. So, you know, it all starts with educating uh, at the executive level, uh, talking about what a cybersecurity program or privacy program would look like in the organization and how they tie in and sort of using that as, as like, you know, your launching pad to sort of educate organization across when it comes to. And, you know, you could do security awareness training or sessions, but I like what I, the approach that I really enjoy is sort of a, uh, is a consulting approach where working with different business leaders across the organization and process owners and sort of helping them understand what their risk is and what they are willing to accept and what they're not and sort of guiding them through that. So that's how I, I, I usually work through it. That's pretty good. I'll come back to the Adriana. Well, thank you, Bashir. So I, I think uh, this is the perfect moment where we are today to talk about integrating security and privacy. Uh, because all of a sudden, we lost the perimeter. Everybody went to work from home. Our customers are all scattered and organizations have started thinking in an innovative way on how do you reach your customers? How do you provide the services to your customers? And they all tried to develop solutions and new models to do that. 
And what I have seen with a lot of, uh, a lot of the clients that I work with, um, unfortunately, they had to do this very quickly. So now they realize I'm collecting all this information about my customers. I'm collecting all this information about my employees and how do I maintain their, their privacy? So finally, they are, they are at the point where they are looking at it from the perspective, I can't have that privacy without the security. We need to work together to start implementing solutions that have security and privacy by design built into them. And I think go, looking forward where this, uh, where we are going, uh, probably uh, somebody was talking about maybe 70% of the workforce will not be returning to work. Uh, now is the time for collaboration. Now is the time to, to build those solutions, uh, collaborating together and uh, get rid of the silos that we had in the past with, uh, usually privacy sitting with the legal counsel, security sitting with technology. And maybe the, and I, and I think uh, Shahid uh, mentioned that or Yubashir, um, where is that intersection point? Understanding the risks, understanding what you want to protect, what are your goals and how you are gonna mitigate those risks together. Absolutely, Arif, you want to add anything quickly? Yeah, so uh, I know when, depending on your industry, some organizations uh, have specific nuances, so you will have a dedicated privacy team. And obviously there's legal implications that the, the security staff may not be able to speak to, and likewise there's technical implications. So depending on the nature of your business, that tie-in needs to be very tight, right? That coordination with security and privacy, they need to really understand each other and then ensure that any type of engagements that they're, they are at least um, in sync with each other, right? It's interesting what all of you said. You guys have made some very important points. Uh, my view always has been that internal audit is about, sorry, risk management is about foresight. You look at what can potentially go wrong. Internal audit is about oversight. You have middle, you have compliance, for organization policies, procedures, rules, laws of the land, contractual uh, obligations that you've made, that you have to do that. And then you got security that actually protects your critical assets, right? Meaning data coming in and out. And you got it in two parts. I am not using the word cyber as you notice. It's security, logical or physical, because it covers everything. One of the problems is that these people all report differently to different parts of the organization. I'll give you a very simple example. This is all this compliance uh, stuff, whether it's PCI or uh, Sarbanes Oxley or any other 27,000, 76% of that is common rated. We didn't, when we were writing PCI, we didn't write it because we pulled it out of thin air. We were using those very standards, yet they are all done separately. Exactly what Adriania talked about is the silos. Solutions therefore then are built in silos. So what I would like to get your feedback now if you take that, you, you address some key parts already, then it comes back to education and awareness, right? Because that's critical. Half the time is the weakest link that becomes a problem. How would you deal with it? I mean, we're not looking for any confidential stuff from your organization, but given that uh, what um, Shai just talked about is absolutely correct, is about playing consultancy role, right? So how do you go about doing that to change this? Again, you want to kick it off, Shahid? Sure. So, so again, like using that approach that I mentioned, and you you touch on the consulting is one of the one of the things that has worked for me in any organization I've gone is 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 you know after you've done your ninety day review and all that is go ahead and form that privacy and security committee, uh, and and call it like whatever whatever name you prefer to call it doesn't matter because the function of that is to sort of bring privacy individuals in the organization, HR, technology people, and legal together and start talking about topics together. Uh, because, you know, the reality is in, in various organizations, not all these functions will ever be under one individual. And even if they are, that doesn't mean that they're all going to be having that those conversations and collaboration. So I've always found that to be really beneficial, so we we do it at MLSC today. We we and we 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 ask all our executive team uh, to be sponsors, and they come and their leaders come also, and we're making it very very uh, like 
the idea is to make it actionable inside out of it rather than just sort of talking about theory and what ifs and stuff. So that that is one of the ways. And then from there, it sort of trickles down within their those teams and organizations. That's right. Chaid, you can go next and we'll give it here the next. So I just I mean, I mean not Chai, the Arif. I'm looking at in the picture and she's in the, my apologies. Arif. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so um, part of it is that, especially with COVID and the new circumstances, um, with security awareness, it, it's heightened because a lot of the, the people are working from home. So a lot of those discussions with privacy to just understand uh, how to just uplift your awareness. You may have something already in, in uh, already rolled out to the organization, but like, how would you need to update it? There's a lot of things that obviously apply to the office, also apply to home, and that needs to be reinforced. You may send out a communique, uh, as well as uh, update uh, your course or just do a, a special course just for uh, work from home, just to kind of reinforce that uh, whatever staff, like whatever they're doing at home, like, I mean, they're under the same obligations, whether it's the code of conduct, uh, social media, electronic access, uh, company assets, et cetera, et cetera. So that needs to be re really reinforced. Yeah. Adriana, you want to add anything to that? Uh, sure. So um, talking to, to CISOs, in, you know, I talk to a lot of different CISOs of different type of organizations these days. And... I get the same message. How do they become the advisor to the business? So the, the, the challenge for all the security organizations or privacy uh, uh, services is to get to be involved from the beginning. So, and that is really coming through identifying who within the business is your champion, who you can use to get the buy-in to involve the business units. And uh, uh, Shahid mentioned putting together the committee, always involve the business, always uh, uh, bring the accountability for the information, for the ownership of, uh, of, the, of the organization resources with the business. Because there was this uh, perception uh, that IT will take care of it, but if, once they take accountability, that is their accountability to protect these resources, the discussion changes. They start understanding that, you know, it's better to involve um, security and privacy. And these days, mm -hmm. security understands that they need to be an enabler. How do you enable the business? How do you help the business reach their goals? Um, and they understand that that happens if they involve them faster. Uh, so they are not the ones saying no all the time. And I think the COVID actually is it's, uh, it's, it's bringing that at the forefront because now all of us are, uh, are, are part of the security of an organization. We are all dispersed all over the place. We start to understand that it's not just how we work with our organization, but how you have your children uh, do their schooling, how you communicate with your friends, all these are part now of, uh, of your privacy, of securing the information that, that you put out there, which is raising the awareness that you need to collaborate. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one uh, very quick thing, Shai, perhaps it was slightly unusual that I had all those areas at Visa, right? Which the only un unusual one would have been the fact that I was also the global head of internal audit and I had security. But security, privacy, compliance, should have been together, and some of the people are looking at that now. I can tell you that, uh, that because it is critical. Compliance, perhaps, uh, is slightly because it's got legal uh, stuff involved, but the other one, and so there is a hope, is what I'm trying to say. But you guys have touched some very interesting areas because I think the companies don't get ahead of this curve. The changes are going to happen regardless, with or without them. Uh, wanting to agree. So that's why they need to understand that we, we better get ahead of this game. Um, the, then it brings up exactly what we just talked about, that the changes are in the offering are happening. None of these people had thought about that 70% of the staff would work from home, right? It's happening. People have lost their jobs. The reports are saying 40% of the people are not going to get their jobs back, at least for the U.S. But regardless, so people will look to change their careers, do whatever. But all that taken into account, the question then becomes, 
is there an appetite to change, meaning from the Chief Information Security Office, GIO, A and B, combined with that, do they have the ability to be able to sell it to the corner suite? Because that's been a big problem always, right? Getting them to see this as a problem when they were measuring only shareholder value. But now things have all changed upside down. So now the question becomes, how are you going about it? Are you able to do that? Uh, knowing that this is happening and getting ahead of the curve and saying, this is a perfect time as Adriana and you also pointed out to get ahead and make the changes. What would you be able to do or what you should do? Again, you can start, Chai. Okay, <laughs> I, I like going first because then uh, it makes it easy for me to, uh, to, to cover what I need to <laughs> We'll turn the, the next one. It's round always round. I find easy to go first uh, in, in yes, these yes. So, so Adriana, sorry, I think you should That's go first next. <laughs> we'll we'll <laughs> go next, go yeah, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Do yeah, it. so, so I, I, you know, I, I would say the approach I like to take is about changing perception or getting buy-in from a security perspective is, you know, especially in this time, in this day and age where we are in COVID-19 and how we're dealing is, is first of all, like, you know, sort of doing two things. Like I, I look at it, security governance and security management as two streams and operations sort of falls under the management. So, the, you know, management is more about doing the things right. Right. So, so if you uh, like to, so, making sure that first of all, your basic hygiene of security is taken care of by your organization. And if you're, so like the, the model we run and I've always run is like, we always have a small security team, uh, an operations team, and then we leverage our IT teams to do a lot of the functions for security, like the deployment of the tools and all that stuff. It, it just a more a, a, from economies of scale. What I find there is that if you have your basic hygiene correct, and especially in this day and age where 70% of the staff and more are working from home and remote, if you are ahead of that curve today, you would get a lot of more credibility within your organization because you, were, you will be seen as that strategic leader who did not think of security as, as sort of like a, a process that had to evolve with COVID-19. So for us, like, you know, uh, we we know our organizations are going through a massive digital transformation. We are becoming more and more cloud first. So our security model was always focused on adopting and adapting to cloud first. So when our employees went all, uh, away, honestly, it took us a couple of weeks to sort of like get a bearings right on the spike of traffic and some of the attacks we were seeing, but we were not caught off guard from the tooling perspective or the processes perspective. So I would say that's very important to do correctly. And the second is, you know, uh, Adrian and I, we, we had talked about this on, on our other call was like, is we as, as leaders in security or privacy, we have to start reaching out in this time to leaders across the organization and saying, hey, how can I help you understand risk and mitigate risk and be faster at it. So if you were doing a 20 page TRA or threat risk assessment or writing a, a massive policy that took you weeks, this is the time where you, I, I know it's gonna, it's not gonna sound right for some individuals, but this is a time to look at your process and say, how do you become really agile? And can you do a one page of threat risk assessment for your business units and help them move faster? And I, I think that's gonna really help. Adriana, go this time. Sure. Um, so, and Shahid uh, uh, touched on this. So become the business enabler. Because if you build solutions that enable the business, the business will talk to you. Um, and second, find a way to communicate the risk. So we are talking about, you know, the budgets are not going to be there anymore. Uh, because of COVID, because of other business priorities, businesses need to keep the lights on. Find where are the right places to invest your money to get the ROI. Show the business why those places need to be fixed. Um, I was talking to one of my clients just last week and they said, you know, that the attacks have increased so massively where we used to have five attacks a day, we have 50,000, 5,000 attacks, we have 50,000 now. So just communicating that in terms of what is the risk to the organization, to the business, it's very important. 
and risk mitigation, talk the, talk the language of the business. If we just talk about we need to go and buy these new tools, they don't understand that. They just see it as a cost. But if you talk about this is how I'm going to spend this money to enable you to, to meet your business objectives, the, the conversation changes. Right. I agree. Arif? Yeah, so I have a, an alternate view here, uh, especially as a service provider. So with the coming of COVID-19, especially if you're on the receiving end of due diligence inquiries of your clients, and obviously as a service provider, credit bureau, we've gotten tons of questionnaires on our BCM, DR, pandemic plans, uh, work from home, third party, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on a strategic basis, I mean, this is a, if you are in the sense a service provider and you're dealing with clients and clients are having those difficult questions on cybersecurity um, with the intakes that are coming in. And if you see a pattern where there's potential uh, gaps or some things that you need to uplift, uh, you can leverage the information based on your clients and you can go back to the business. Okay, you know what, this is going to help us with our business because um, if it's bad, then potentially you can lose business. But if you're in a strong position or if there's things that you need to uh, uplift in your control environment, that can help you in, in potential uh, RFPs and other bids that you're making against your competitors, right? So I think this is, a, especially for a service provider, if you're willing to, uh, you can get the money spent on cybersecurity if, if there's that ROI, where, where, especially around clients, right? I mean, compliance is a big issue, but when... Um, if you have a huge client and they want something, they're spending a lot of money and they're about to walk away or potentially you need to make that deal. This is where you truly can be a, a good enabler for the business. You, you, you'll be happy to hear for the longest time I've been saying about PCI, I don't care if the, somebody's PCI compliant, I would rather see them secure because the whole purpose of that type of approach is not to create penalties for people. If people are playing, paying penalties, then we have failed because the idea is to change behavior. The second part, which I think I, I've also heard, but I've experienced this first and all the time and I see it big time now, is that if you go into companies, everybody knows what to do, but they don't know the why. They have no clue why they're doing it because there's a process and policy and procedure in place because we have never been transparent about why we were doing something. And if you look at either people don't have times because the way the structures work, so what that does is when the why changes, you have a problem because everybody knows what to do. So that's been the culture of the organization that I tell you what to do. And it's only the security guy who understands that. But like we already agreed that security is a shared responsibility. You need to educate them. So that's the other challenge. And that's why I think what you guys talked about consult, uh, becoming a consultant, very important, which means you build a trust, right? They cannot see you guys as always saying no, because that's what was happening for years. You bring a security guy and he said, no, you can't do this, it'll be a problem. That's why I use the word risk management because there's risk, but you manage it. And it's the same principle applies here. So I think that that leads to how, uh, when you look at that approach, right? And now there's gonna be budgets cut. Very little doubt about that because businesses revenues are gone. They are revisiting, if I was, the company I would turn on, freeze every project for a second to validate that the needs are still the same, right? The new needs, because the, you don't want to go with, ahead with a project because you planned something six months ago, the world's changed upside down. What are the needs going forward? So that you adjust that to that. So how are you going to make sure that your budgets don't get cut because corporations don't look at each area the way people think. They just go for 5% cut here, 7%. And somebody's told, okay, I need 5% cut from your side, right? I mean, you all have experienced that. How would you deal with that now going forward to make sure that you don't suffer that? You can go, Adriana, first since you were the, being the last. <laughs> well, I was going to let the other two because they have to deal with the cuts. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is true. Absolutely. absolutely. But so maybe your... I'll let uh, Arif start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Arif, go ahead. Yeah, so I think um, obviously cuts, there's going to be some challenges and um, depending on, you'd have to prioritize what are the projects, right? You can't get everything done. 
uh, you, you may you have a huge bucket list of a certain amount of money and because of the circumstances you may take a 20 to 30 percent cut maybe even deeper or maybe less right so you take a um, a prioritization approach and and kind of understand okay if you're an organization that undergoes certain types of audits right that are coming through the air whether it's pci as you mentioned this year right. SOC, iso right um or, or there could be client implications right um, or regulatory implications. It all depends on what you're protecting and you'd have to kind of take that risk assessment and really understand, okay, uh, here's our budget. Where do we, what's, what's nice to have? What do we need and what, what do we have to have? And take it from there and have those conversations and really, really understand that, especially in the business terms, what, what is the issue, right? You can't discuss it in a very technical terms because the business and the executives won't understand, but they understand Correct. The potential revenue consequences right the or operational consequences right Correct. like what is the impact to our customer Absolutely. what is that service impact and that's the that's a discussion you need to really really frame with, with the executives because that's what they understand that's true you are the guys who do the thing yourself right <laughs> one is outsourcing the other one is uh, consulting how about you guys exactly so you know so like our comes more from like a service provider angle I'm coming more from like running a security program for an organization in Canada right so so I think for us is the approach uh, and you know this again my recommendation is again having that conversation about risk so one one thing that every security leader should do and should always do is understand what are the threats and risks for your organization so if you have a good understanding of that what risks you really want to protect and you've sort of ranked them in a way of high medium low whatever methodology you're using then when it comes to those cuts then it becomes really easy to understand what mm. cuts are not possible so like you know if the if the i'll give you a very simple example like if your organization and the executive team are really worried about malware attacks and stuff like that and that's a risk you want to mitigate right and you've implemented a, a tool like cisco amp for endpoint detection response you it becomes very easy to explain to them why you cannot cut that right as because you've identified this as your basic hygiene so once you go down your list of risks and once you start hitting those medium and low risks those are the projects i usually look at and say yeah yeah we can park it for next month or we cannot park it and stuff like that the other thing i would say is like this is a really good time for security leaders and security organizations who might not have the budget to look at our existing processes and see how we can make them better without looking for tools right like you know a tool will help but if your process is flawed a tool's not going to really do anything for you uh, bingo, you hit the nail on the head. Do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I, I will add something to it. So I think this is the opportunity for uh, the organizations to start looking inwards and look at all those tools they bought over, over the years that are not configured to do what they were supposed to do. So I, I was having this discussion with another client last week and they said, well, I said, well, how many tools do you have, for example, for, uh, for data leakage prevention? And they said, oh, we have one tool here and one tool here. And I said, so why do you have so many? So this is the time to look at them. And, and in the end he said, well, I don't think they are configured really to do what they were supposed to do. So this is the time to start looking why you have so many tools. How are you gonna use those tools that you have to the best of your abilities? And also understand why are you making those investments? Are those investments in the right places? If, if there is a shift now towards something like a work from home environment, do you need to actually uh, be more strategic about where you put your money and build towards that, that new model rather than try to fix the old models that you are working on? You know, that's actually a very important point you made and I'm glad Shahid you started that part that if you went to an organization, you want to understand where the data enters your system, where it goes through, where it's resting, at, you know, who touches it, why they touch it. Do we need to and have that, that process? Companies don't do that. When they come and tell you, here's a shiny object you need and your problem will get solved. So let's put one thing to bed. There never was and there never will be a silver bullet for cybersecurity. 
So if anybody's thinking that maybe they need to take it out of their mind, there's an incremental things you do exactly as what you just suggested, which really means this, there couldn't be a better time to take a step back to understand, right? What are your processes, policies, streamline them, make them easier, but communicate, communicate and communicate more because then you can actually really get to the root of, of, of those problems. So now when you look at, uh, so now that there's a very important point that uh, you guys made there. So it's really a question of, uh, again, back to education. Now, I think there were two, three other things that we can bring hopefully some questions from people as well. Um, I think there was intellectual property rights. I think you had mentioned even uh, Arif last time, there was that, there was the industrial espionage. We certainly looked at that yesterday, right now, somebody's uh, in medical field and you're doing COVID uh, vaccine. Guess what? You're very popular with the bad guys because they want to get in to find out uh, what exactly you have done. When you start looking at that, but there's also a third piece in there with all those things happening, is to educating the corner suite. Remember, corner suite is looking at the bottom line, right? Profits, shareholder value, my market went up, this happened, that happened. We are now talking about completely different because right now, for many organizations, question of survival, right? <clears throat> so how would you go, now we're not talking about educating the staff, but you want to get proactive right now <clears throat> to the corner suite so that A, you don't suffer the budget cuts, that people understand that this is a very important area and they better invest, but you prioritize so you have a business case. So you're not telling them firewall and rules. You're telling them not the features, but you're telling them benefits of why you would do this, right? What it could prevent. Because security is not the easiest to build a business case for the corner suite because you are preventing an attack. The sales guy can say, give me a million dollars, I'll produce three million, right? You don't have that. You are saying, I'm going to prevent something. So it's not the easiest to quantify, but it is very easy when you talk about compliance, the brand impact, the, the possible penalties. How would you go about doing that? Volunteers, uh, Arif, you want to start? Since you did yeah, so um, yeah, so one, especially in the current circumstances uh, with a lot of malware and with the COVID discovery and intellectual property, uh, intellectual property rights. Um, I guess people think of maybe certain countries overseas, right? But there's also countries that are potential potential allies of yours. They might be involved in this type of industrial espionage, right? Um, I think, especially when you're dealing with the C-suite, the best examples are things that have published in the media. Right. Okay, this company may have gone through a breach, this has occurred, that gives you a perfect example. Okay, you know what, so what, it could happen, right? But here's an example of something that has happened. And if you can kind of take a lot of that information that is in the mainstream media or something that they may, may, may not have seen, but um, it has occurred. And as well as if, if there's lawsuits. So there's a lot of the C-suite is, is <clears throat> reputation is huge and legal implications is massive. And some of these lawsuits where the payouts are heavy uh, around uh, privacy uh, regulations in certain jurisdictions, uh, civil lawsuits, lit litigation, like that gets them worried, right? Reputation is really, really important. And I think when you take those examples, uh, that, that's a very great way of framing the discussion, right? Yep. It could happen. It did happen. Correct. Shane? Yeah, so I would say, you know, everything that we've talked about, education, being consultants, learning the business, it sort of is, it sort of was training to go and talk to this, uh, the C-suite in the corner office, right? Because if you, if you as a leader, as a security privacy leader did not understand what your organization function is, what are the key processes, what are the key risks to the organization, which are the lines of business you really need to help with. I hate to say this, if you don't know all those, it will be very hard to justify the function of security in times of COVID-19 or any pandemic, or and not just pandemic, even if you, if you had sort of an industry-wide impact uh, through it. So, you know, so that's why, like, you know, to me, security is like a marathon. It's never going to be a sprint, like a software development sprint. It's always going to be a marathon. So I would say, you know, when you go to the C-suite to convince them, you need to understand what they really care about. So if 
if your C-suite cares about the reputation risk, it cares about the privacy of the data of the individuals they hold to like players or employees or customers, it makes a really easy discussion to justify things that are needed. So again, I would say, and, and the last thing is, you know, one thing we have to be realistic is that, you know, if your CEO appetite for risk is really high, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about it. That's, that's how they, they see risk. So your role is to, again, educate them and help them understand it. But in the end, you're a consultant. They have to accept the risk. Right. Absolutely. So, Adriana, can you add something quickly because we are starting to run a little bit. Sure. Before. So, yeah. um, actually, so education is still up there and uh, make it real for them. So, I, I, I will give you an example. So, I was working with a wealth management company and uh, we were talking about for them to do a privacy engagement and CEO and CFO could not see it, why they needed to do this. And when I started talking to them about, uh, you know, you have this, the information for some very uh, wealthy individuals in your organization, and you are providing information to them, and they are providing information to you, and those channels are not secured, you, you only have to lose their data once, and nobody will do business with you anymore. Right. So get, giving them that, uh, that example uh, changed their mind uh, completely. They said, oh, my God, I never thought about that. Well, That's... make it real for them. Once you make it real, they will understand the need. So let me park uh, uh, one other. Sorry, Michelle, I just want to add one, one point yeah. I forgot to mention. Um, there's also the board, right? So if you're part of cybersecurity, if you can – present or even have your management team above you present cybersecurity risk to the board, that's another driver where, okay, you know what, uh, you are presenting to your executive team, but then the board is aware as well. And the board can kind of understand and, and uh, apply, have those discussions with the exec, the, the C-suite. That's why I was referring to with the corner suite and the board, because if you have representation into that, you have into the other one too. Uh, but good point. Here's very quickly, because we, we're going to, one of the things we haven't talked about is that the reason why there are skills gaps, insecurity, and I don't mean people holding pieces of paper because I've seen uh, all sorts of different things. But my point is not about paper, it's about the problem solvers, the, the thinkers. Right? When we talk about knowledge, you're talking about don't memorize it, expand your thinking, right? That's what knowledge is about. Here's the thing. We have outsourced a hell of a lot of stuff right out of the country, never mind to another company. You guys are fortunate that you are here, right? If the protectionism will start, which looks like it will, because when companies are down, monies are, are uh, scarce, uh, the countries who can already see the US, China, and a few other places already getting into a battle. If that was to happen, a lot of companies could be exposed because their skill sets were really somewhere else because they outsourced it, right? And they might not be, and we have seen it with the mask, N95 uh, mask problem, where Canada was supplying the raw materials and buying the masks back from US is a classic example. There are more other stuff like that. So the question becomes, what would you be doing when, when it comes to outsourcing right now to make sure that you're building those skills back in your companies if that eventuality was to happen? Oh. Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I, I'll Good. start because I have these conversations quite often these days with uh, CISOs where, you know, there, there are not enough people to do all the jobs that need to be done. And uh, looking in the future, I think there needs to be more automation in, into, we have AI, machine learning. Uh, we talked about being uh, able to do adapt, adaptive uh, uh, authentication for for access to to our resources. So one one option is put more automation in place uh, to deal with the with the shortage of skills and also with decision making because otherwise you have the users making decisions. Uh, obviously, there are challenges with that as well. You need to teach them how to do the right thing, given those <laughs> models that you design. And the second, you don't need to build everything in house. So uh, just because you need today an SAP skills and tomorrow cloud skills and the day after something else, doesn't mean that you have to have all these skills in-house. 
So um, some of the CISOs talk to me about uh, building uh, relationships and partnerships where they can draw on those resources as they need them. So they don't have to build those resources in-house uh, uh, and pay for those resources for a whole year when they might need different resources at different times. Just to clarify, I was not talking about not outsourcing. I was talking about outsourcing out of the country, which is creating big exposure. But you answered that correct. I agree. Uh, what about you, Shahid? I, I agree with everything what Adrian said. The only thing I, I could add to this is, is that, you know, I, I still think that outsourcing will be a norm in certain functions of cyber or in security. But I would still say, like, when it comes to security engineering aspects or the governance pieces or just overall understanding of your program still needs to reside in-house. So, <clears throat> so, you know, the let, let's call the worker bees. They could still be outsourced in certain areas, but having a few individuals in your team or like Adrian said, is like, you know, using local organizations in Toronto that can help you also. Right. Non-essential effectively is what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. yeah since you are in the outsourcing business, you could benefit from what the question I asked, what do you think, Arif? Actually, technically, I'm not really outsourcing. Right? No, 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 no. Yeah, but. In that sense. But, but um, in this aspect, especially with the skills shortage and if companies have budgetary constraints, uh, one of the options just for in-house is you can deal with uh, job shadowing or job rotation. So there are certain functions in, in the organization uh, work really closely with security, whether it's within the IT infrastructure space, privacy, uh, legal compliance, a lot of the technology groups. So some of those individuals can partially be trained, right? Or, or get right. them on uh, assignments, right? You can share the knowledge. A lot of companies have their own internal lunch and learns. Like, I mean, outsourcing is not going to go away. You may need no. to reach to an external consultant, but if you have some of those resources, you don't want to have a single point of failure with that, with that one network uh, security engineer. So you'd, you'd kind of try to build as much of that capacity in-house and document things and just get other people to kind of learn a bit with uh, job rotation and shadowing yeah, to reduce I, that risk. I, absolutely. I think that's the key right there is that you take the non-essential skills uh, and, you know, the the work that can be done which doesn't compromise you and you can build a lot of where the expertise is still sitting with you also there is over reliance on technology that technology is going to solve everything by itself uh that's also not necessarily true it is a tremendous enabler used properly the other thing i think that uh Said talked about earlier and i'm just recapping that is that you need to make sure that there's standardization of tools as well don't run after shiny objects only buy what you must. I think maybe there's a question here. Let's see. Um, um, okay, it's just been told three more minutes. Okay, yep. So, um, so don't run after shiny objects. Understand your own needs. And I think all of you have said that there's quite a bit. This is a brilliant discussion to where we were going and have where we've gone already and identified. So just to recap some of the highlights we already talked about. The technology, you know, standardization, streamline, education awareness, which means communication, get the buy-in from the corner suite, of course, the, the board. If you can get the structural thing improved to allow independence would be even that much uh, better. Uh, one, and, and of course, there's no playbook for what's happened. So that means you want people to think, right? Uh, what has happened here? The one thing I would turn around and add as we wrap this thing up is that I never allowed a staff to work more than two years in job in internal audit and risk management. And here's the reason why. When they got familiar with the problem, it always ran into trouble because you go in, you see even with a lot of the big companies when they're doing consulting, they come in with a hundred page PowerPoint. Well, I don't want to see that. I want a blank piece of paper to understand what your problems are. Now, Adriana, is in a, uh, she said something right at the start, which is important, that look, I don't know, I'm new to this area, which makes it perfect, because then you're asking questions, right? You almost need to take that approach with, with, uh, with security, with risk management to say, by the way, why are we doing this? Start asking, why are we doing this? 
and you will end up with either changing the process or saying it's redundant and you'll do the same thing with the tools and the standardized. So you don't run into seven people responsible for big data in a big financial organization because each is working in a different area. You want one person, right? And they all talk to them. And, and But I think it's been fantastic. It's really too bad. Uh, we don't have more time because I know you guys have got a lot of interesting things to share. I probably might do something with you guys separately to build it to augment this. So hopefully people will stay in, in touch on that. So um, let me just, I think uh, somebody is asked, to, large number of security vendors available. How do you decide who to trust? Ah, that's a very good question. You, you trust somebody who comes and understands your problem and your pain points, not theirs. If they're trying to help you and understand your pain point and point, point out to you how you can sell that concept, that's the people I would, I would trust rather than, hey, I've got this thing, buy that, right? It's fantastic. And well, a lot of companies have ended up buying tools, like you guys have already said, they don't even use because they didn't train people, they didn't set it up properly. So why did you buy it? Because somebody convinced you and because you have a budget? That's not a good enough reason to buy. So go with vendors you know you can trust, right? Who are addressing your needs. And, so. and I will add something to that. So, and this is because we, we have more vendors, people had to do things uh, right away. Uh, the importance of a vendor management, <coughs> risk management program, to be able to, to review them from, from the, that perspective. Are they doing what they, they say they are doing how how do we trust that they are the right uh, the right solutions for us right absolutely and and your solution can come from the lowest rank so don't assume they always come from the top so thank you very much shahid i really appreciate uh, arif uh, and thank you adriana it was a very good discussion and we'll pick it up i think we can do a separate round <laughs> and record it for people because this is a very good uh, topic so uh for sure yeah. appreciate it my pleasure, yeah. Elbi, and thank you for doing that. Elby. Sorry we missed uh, um, Jamie, but uh, I hope he's well. So thank you very much, folks, for your time you took uh, in here, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. All the thank best. You. God bless. Right. Pleasure. Bye-bye.